Good morning and welcome to our Daily Word and Prayer. My name is Tom Short. So glad to have you along with us today as we get in the Word of God, talk about it. This is Holy Week. This is our week. This is the week that changed the world. I trust it's the week that changed your life. And indeed, the things we talk about this week that culminated in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, they are life-changing. And so I hope you'll join us all week long as we look at his life and we look at these events. Jesus would often say his hour had not yet come, but this week that we're celebrating is his hour. It was coming, and it's all building up to what we're, we're seeing this week. His years of ministry were all building up this week. Yesterday, if you weren't with us, we saw the, about the triumphal entry, and we noticed some things that we, we probably don't tend to realize about what went on that day. I don't know if you realize that Jesus, when David was rejected as king and overthrown by an insurrection and driven out of, out of the, uh, Jerusalem, David and, the, of course, the Messiah is the son of David, the route he took out through the Kindred Valley, up through the Mount of Olives, out through uh, Bethany and beyond the Jordan is the same route Jesus took when he came back into Jerusalem. And we looked at that yesterday. But we saw also how the people who were celebrating him and laying their garments on the ground as he rode in upon that colt, that donkey, uh, as he rode into Jerusalem, how they did not realize that this was also, they realized it was Lamb Selection Sunday, excuse me, Lamb Selection Day. They didn't have Sundays yet. It wasn't called that. Lamb Selection Day. And as he did that, as he rode in there, they did not realize that he was about, he was presenting himself not only as the Messiah, but as the Lamb of God who take away the sins of the world. Well, anyway, we elaborated on that yesterday. If you didn't catch yesterday's video, make sure and check it out. You just go to my YouTube page, and they're all in, in order, so you just find in the playlist there the one that played yesterday. But let's get on to today. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, the first thing he did was he went into the temple and he created some controversy. He sure did. The first thing he did, this was his hour. It was now time to, he, every day was playing with Jesus, but now it was time to bring it all to a head. Let's read in Matthew chapter 21 what went on here. It says, and Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a robber's den. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, and the children were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They became indignant and said to him, Do you not hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read out of the mouths, out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have prepared praise for yourself? Matthew 21, verses 12 through 16. What was going on here? Why did he do this? Of course, Jesus came into the temple, and the thing that concerned Jesus was his Father's glory. Jerusalem was the place where the temple was, the place where the glory of God was to dwell. And it had become a den of thieves. It had become a place for robbers. It had become corrupt. The temple, the religion of God, had become idolatrous. It had become hungry for money, hungry for power. Jerusalem was the seat of, of, of power in Israel, both religious and political. Herod the Great had his home there. Of course, he had, other, he had places all over, uh, all over Israel. He was a builder, but he taxed to build, and the taxes were oppressive, and the religious leaders were oppressive, and Jesus was having none of it. People are not meant to be oppressed by their government or by their religious leaders. They're meant to be free to know God, to worship God, to serve God, and to love God. So Jesus, right off the bat, he kind of stirred up some controversy here. 
He went in, can you imagine this? Going into the temple and overturning the money changers tables. Well, who are the, these money changers? It was required to pay a shekel, to pay uh, in Jewish, um, in Hebrew uh, currency, to pay your, your gifts, your offerings. And many of the people did not have shekels, so they had to exchange their currency, the Roman currency, into the Hebrew, the Jewish currency of shekels. And so there are guys there, basically money. I'll take your Roman currency and I'll give you Jewish currency. I'll give you shekels. But they're ripping people off. It was a ripoff. It, it, the, the exchange rates, they were, making, they were making themselves wealthy on it. And others were selling sacrifice because you had to go in and offer sacrifices. And so if they didn't have a sacrifice, they didn't have a uh, uh, whatever, you know, lamb or, or a, if you're poor, a pigeon or whatever you'd have to offer, you could buy one there because you had to go offer to God as a sacrifice. And they're ripping people off. And obviously, the scribes and the Pharisees, the rulers of the temple, were in on it. They were enriching themselves. We said, we see in Luke, it says they, they were lovers of money. And so they wanted to get their hands on their part, their, their, uh, you know, their portion of it. And all of this was a ripoff of people who were simply going to worship God and do their duty under the law of worshiping God. They were being taken advantage of. And it bothered Jesus. It bothered Jesus. And he did something about it. Question comes up, well, did Jesus sin here? A lot of people think he did. Because this is not the meek, mild Jesus that we're used to seeing in movies or we're here, you know, kind of like he was kind of a pacifist, hippie type guy. This was a Jesus who was angry. This was a Jesus who took action. This was not a Jesus turning the other cheek to these, these, uh, these people who were oppressing and taking advantage of those who did not have the means of the poor. These were people who, were, who Jesus was angry with. And I think the key here is he was angry for the glory of God. It was not, not a, it, he, was he offended? Of course he was. But he was not offended because like someone took his parking place or didn't prepare the meal at the restaurant well or, or something like this. He was offended because God's glory was at stake. He said his father's house was to be called a house of prayer. And they had turned it into a, a thing about lust and power and money. And it bothered him. And he took action. Now, this is a Jesus we've got to realize because God does hate sin and God is bothered by sin. We believe that God loves sinners, but God hates sin. And it's interesting also that who was Jesus angry at here? He was angry at people who were taking advantage of others who were proud, self-righteous, arrogant. I know I uh, in my early Christian days, I was often told that Jesus was uh, very hard with the religious people, very harsh with the religious people, but very gentle and kind with sinners. And I'm not sure I buy that, because the truth is these scribes and Pharisees were sinners as well. They were breaking the law. They were coveting. They were th stealing. Jesus was a, uh, calling them thieves. They were the, I, th I think who Jesus was harsh with and strong and powerful with and reproved and rebuked strongly were the self-righteous and the proud, whether they were religious or not. If they were self-righteous, Jesus spoke hard to them to, hung, to bring them to humility. If on the other hand, they were humble and broken and realized their sinfulness and had repentance about them. Oh God, I've done wrong. I'm sorry, and they and, and the sense of of uh, not taking pride in their sin. Jesus was very gracious and kind to those and merciful to those. I think in our day it's interesting to me that I I know some of my years of campus evangelism. It struck me that often the most self righteous people are some of the people who who are the most sinful. The, the, we would have thought the biblically most sinful, but they take pride in their sin and they think it's okay and they boast in it 
and they and they say God loves me and it's okay, it's no problem. I'm okay. This this isn't that bad. Keep in mind God's grace goes to the humble. God's grace goes to the humble, but God is the God who opposes the proud. And if you're self-righteous and proud, watch out because this is what Jesus did to them in the temple. Well, it raises a question, is it ever okay for you and me to be angry? If Jesus was, some people would say, well, he's God, uh, he's different, but you can't have it both ways. Sometimes people tell me, be like Jesus until Jesus does something that they don't like, and they say, well, don't be like him there. No, we do follow Jesus, and there are times, brothers and sisters, that you and I should be bothered, bothered by sin. Um, sometimes I think we've become way too passive towards sin. We do believe in grace. We do believe in mercy. We do believe mercy triumphs over judgment. We do believe that we should show love towards sinful people. These are all important things, and, and historically sometimes Christians have been over on the other side where they haven't shown grace, mercy, or kindness to people, to, to human beings who need it. And so it is good that we show this, but sometimes, you know, human beings, we tend to pendulum swing. And sometimes we may go from a time in history where we didn't show kindness and grace to where maybe we show too much and have lost the ability to be upset and angry at sin. Sin destroys people. Sin is of the devil. Sin kills. Uh, we need to have a hatred of sin. We love the sinner, but we hate the sin. And I've found in my own life that the more I love a sinner, the more I will hate the sin that's destroying them. And I've also found if I don't hate their sin, I find I don't really love them very much. Now, it takes great maturity to figure this out. It takes great maturity to walk this, to make sure that I'm not angry at the person because they've bothered me, they've offended me, but I'm angry at the sin that's destroying them and I must speak against it. There are times when we should not be, when we should be outraged and sometimes we're a little bit too passive when it comes to sin, a little bit too accepting, a little bit too non-judgmental. We don't want to be, you know, like the judgmental type critics of, you know, that we read some in history that are mocked and ridiculed, but we also don't want to lose sight of what Jesus was like here when the Father's glory was at stake and people's lives were at stake and people who were simply wanting to worship God were being oppressed and taken advantage of. He'd have nothing of it. One final thing I want to say here now, it's this. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, do you not know that you, you are, are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy and that is what you are. Brothers and sisters, we are the temple of God now. It, it, the temple's gone, and the temple in Jerusalem's gone. Where is the temple? Is it that church building you go to on Sunday morning? Yeah, no. We call it the house of God, but really it's you and me. If you're a believer in Christ, the Spirit of God dwells in you. And I want to encourage you today that just as Jesus was ruthless with sin, let's be that in our own life. We're holy. We're to be holy. Our lives are to be holy but from the inside out. The lust, the greed, the power, the love of money that was in that temple, don't tolerate it in your own life because you're the temple of God and you're to be holy. And so whatever it is in your life, understand God loves you, but God does hate our sin. And so we want to line up with God. We want to align with him and we want to love what he loves, hate what he hates. And indeed, if there's sin in our lives, let's learn to hate that sin and say, I'm going to, by the power of God, the grace of God, I'm done with it. I'm going to deal with this. I'm going to get it out of my life because I am holy. I'm the temple of God. I'm holy for the Lord. That goes for us individually. That goes for us as the body of Christ. We want to be people who honor God and live as God calls us to. He calls us to be holy as he's holy. Amen? Let's pray about this. Father, 
We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ and the example he set for us and the zeal that he had. Jesus, the zeal that you had for the glory of God. We thank you that you hated sin, but we want to thank you also that you love sinners. Indeed, this very week that we celebrate and remember is going to culminate in a few days where you offered your life as a sacrifice for sinners. And indeed, even those very people that you you rebuked and you overturned their tables, Jesus, you were going to die for them. And even those who had you nailed to the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. We thank you, Jesus, for what a forgiving God, forgiving Savior you are. We pray that also, though, we would remember that we are to be holy as you're holy. And I pray, Father, that in, in our love for you, you give us a hatred of sin. Might we love what is right and hate what is evil. Might we love you, Father, and hate the evil one. And I pray, Father, teach us this maturity to know how to not cross the line that we hate people when in really what we do is we just hate sin and help us to start with our own life, to root our own sin out, to take the log out of our own eye so we can see clearly even as we help others. We pray and bless you and love you. Thank you for these things we've learned today. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Isn't the Word of God awesome? It truly is. I hope you'll join us every day. We come here. I, I hope you come. If you're new, welcome. I hope you'll subscribe to the channel, like the video, share it with your friends, post on your social media. Make it a part of your day, whether 8.30 a.m. live when we're here or later in the day at your own convenience or even listening to the podcast on the Apple, Spotify, or Google platform. Just search for Tom the Preacher. But I encourage you, make this a part of your day. We've got to be in the Word of God every day. If you're not, you're going to be weak in the Lord. You're going to lack discernment, lack wisdom, lack strength. These things come from the Word of God. And I pray that you will let that, let God's Word fill your heart, fill your mind. Hey, this is our week. We're going to be celebrating Jesus, and we'll be looking at the events of this holy week throughout the week. So I hope you'll join us. God bless you. I love you, and we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye-bye.